Okay, could somebody confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, today is February 2nd, start of a new month. And let me share my screen. We are beginning week, week five, or excuse me, ending week five. You should be able to see my screen now. Let's get that over there. So today, what we're supposed to be working on is uh, chapter five. And it looks like I've got chapter five for next week. Did we start chapter five? Yes, we did. We did. I was afraid of that. I got a little bit ahead of myself, so I shouldn't have done that. Um, it's all right to be ahead, I guess. It's better being ahead than behind, but... Uh, Let's go to slide 19. Yeah, I remember talking about that. All right. <clears throat> so on the schedule here, we might finish chapter five, in which case we'll be ahead next week too. We'll see, although chapter six probably will take more than a day. So maybe a little bit of chapter six on there will work. Let's go ahead and do that, just to remind me to do that. Although chapter eight's three days, and that will take close to that, but uh, that'll be enough for uh, chapter eight. So if we fall behind, we'll be good there. Let's see. You had a quiz this week. Any questions or comments about it? All right, I guess not. Let's there's, there was no quiz this week. Oh, you're right. That's last week. What am I doing? Oh, that's that's next week. I'm right. Next week. Right, right. There's no quiz this week. You're right. You scared me for a minute there. Yeah, yeah. I scared myself too. I'm looking at the wrong thing. I put that change in there because I said. We should probably start chapter six on Tuesday because I don't think we'll have enough time to finish it on Thursday. So I'll put that in there. And we're definitely going to finish chapter five on Tuesday, if not earlier. I'll try to go slow today, not finish chapter five today. We probably won't finish chapter five today. And then we have a lab tonight, uh, lab sick, dis diffusion and antibiotics. I did send out the number for your unknown project. So you have a number for your unknown bacteria. If you haven't looked at that, I guess you should look at it. Um, you don't need to do anything yet. It will take a week before you get any results. You started last Tuesday, the gelatin hydrolysis test, but you won't get results for a week. And this Sunday, I'm going to have you start the gram stain. And on Monday, the PR lactose test. And then I'll send out the results on Tuesday, assuming I get my act together, which I kind of already have uh, everything started. So it shouldn't be a problem. All right. Any questions about what we're doing? I had a question. Do we start writing notes since you send out an email? Uh, about what? About you starting the first um, test. Uh, I haven't sent you the results yet. You won't get the results until Tuesday. The first three tests I choose for you. After that, you choose all the tests. Okay, so we start notes after you send us the results. You could. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, I think um, that's Professor? It. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, do you happen to have any office towers? And by any chance, can we like inform um, 
you about the Unknowns Project. I didn't quite hear what you were talking about. So let me say that the office hours are to be arranged. The easiest way to do it is to have it during the lab if you don't mind it being public or okay. we can just wait until all the other students log off. You guys have been okay. logging off really early, which is fine, but uh, uh, we can wait until all the other students log off and then you'll have privacy. Another thing is just to arrange with me a time to do it. So I that's see. the office hours for an online class. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right, let's erase that and start the lesson. So I talked about ribosome, ribozymes and mentioned that they are enzymes. It's just they're a little different because they're not protein enzymes. They are enzymes made up of RNA. And we'll never discuss RNA enzymes again, except briefly when we're talking about uh, translation, I'll mention that it's the RNA portion of the ribosome, which is taking the amino acids off of the growing polypeptide chain and adding it to the new amino acid, which is just added, which is connected to the tRNA. And you'll see that when we talk about protein translation. So let's talk a little bit about metabolic diversity. There is metabolic diversity among all organisms. We're only going to talk about microbes, and they have metabolic diversity too. You can divide organisms in where they get their energy source. Excuse me, I'm getting a little closer to the computer. And where they get their carbon source from. And if ever you get a little confused on how you divide organisms, just divide it down to this very basic step. And if they get their energy source, well, let's move on to the next slide. If they get their energy source from light, we call them a phototroph. And if the organism gets its energy needs from an inorganic or an organic chemical compound, we call them a, a chemotroph. Any questions about that? So all organisms can be divided on where they get their energy source from. We can also divide all, all organisms by where they get their carbon source from. If they get their carbon source from carbon dioxide, either dissolved in the water or in the air, we call them an autotroph. If they get their carbon from an organic carbon source, such as glucose, we call them a heterotroph. You should know, did I say that right? Autotroph and heterotroph? Heterotroph? Uh, if you should know that we people are heterotrophs, we get our carbon from organic chemical molecules, primarily glucose, but any carbohydrate and any food we digest like protein or lipids, we can get carbon from that. Uh, but our principal carbon source is actually glucose. And when we eat carbohydrate, it'll just be broken down into glucose or converted into glucose. So glucose is our primary source of carbon, but we can metabolize lipids and uh, protein. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the term or later in this lesson, I don't remember which <laughs> I should remember, but when do we talk about that? I think it's later in this lesson. Green plants, you should know, are autotrophs. They get their carbon from CO2. And of course, green plants are also phototrophs. They derive their energy from light. And we're a chemotroph. We derive our energy from an organic chemical compound. 
Any question about that? So let's briefly mention that um, mainly prokaryotes can derive their energy needs from an inorganic chemical compound. And those are the chemosynthetic bacteria. We'll talk a little bit more about them in the next slide. If ever you get confused on how to divide organisms up, just go to the very basic level and say, are they a phototroph or are they a chemotroph? And are they an autotroph or are they a heterotroph? Because these are very easy. You can combine all of these together, in which case it's a little more complex. And if you divide all organisms on both their energy and their carbon sources, you can define the organisms as a photoautotroph. These are organisms that get their energy needs from light and their um, carbon from CO2. And I think you guys all know these green plants are photoautotrophs. So are the green bacteria and the algae, the photosynthetic uh, protists. And you probably know chemoheterotrophs. People are chemoheterotrophs. They get their energy needs from an, a uh, chemical, an organic chemical such as glucose, and they get their carbon from an organic chemical such as uh, carbon, uh, excuse me, uh, glucose. Now, uh, you don't have to be that way. You can get their uh, well, you could get their uh, energy needs and their carbon from organic and inorganic sources. Only the uh, chemosynthetic bacteria use inorganic sources for getting their energy needs. Is there a chemoheterotroph? Yes, yeah, there's some uh, bacteria which get their uh, carbon. Is that right? I don't think there's any organism that gets their carbon from an inorganic carbon source. The chemoautotrophs and the chemoheterotrophs are a little more difficult to discuss. So let me move to the next slide to talk about them. The photoautotrophs get their energy needs from light, their carbon from carbon dioxide, and you know green plants are photoautotroph, but also the cyanobacteria, the photosynthetic bacteria. You can have the uh, photoautotrophs in two types, those that produce oxygen, and that would be the cyanobacteria, the plants, the algae. There's also anoxygenic photoautotrophs, and they do not produce oxygen. They do produce food from light and carbon dioxide, but uh, they uh, do not produce oxygen. And you probably have never heard of these, but the green, purple, the green and purple sulfur bacteria are anoxygenic photoautotrophs. Uh, let's move down to the chemoheterotrophs because this is a little easier to discuss. Um, getting their energy needs from a chemical. It can be an organic chemical such as glucose, but the energy source can be inorganic, an inorganic chemical such as um, nitrite or nitrate or hydrogen sulfide gas or ammonia or um, iron. And it's the chemosynthetic prokaryotes that, that get their energy source from an inorganic chemical. Uh, for the carbon source, as far as I know, all chemoheterotrophs get their carbon from an organic chemical compound such as glucose. And this includes people and animals, protozoa, the fermentative bacteria, such as E. coli would be a chemoheterotroph, uh, the protozoa, the fungi, and many bacteria, which I guess would be E. coli. Um, so almost all the bacteria we grow in the lab 
or chemoheterotrophs. We almost never grow photoautotrophs in the lab. Uh, the chemoautotrophs are organisms, and as far as I know, they're all prokaryotes that get their energy source from a chemical, an inorganic chemical compound like hydrogen sulfide gas, iron, ammonia, nitrates, nit nitrite. And you'll notice that there are some chemosynthetic bacteria that are chemoautotrophs, another chemosynthetic bacteria that are chemoheterotrophs. What is the difference? The difference is where they get their carbon source. There are chemoheterotrophs if they get their carbon from an organic compound such as glucose, and they are a chemoautotroph if they get their carbon source from CO2. Uh, you're actually familiar with uh, one chemoautotroph, and that is if you lift up the tank in your toilet, not the bowl, but the tank that holds the water, you'll see some brown or ye yellowish scum on the back of that tank. That is actually iron oxidizing bacteria, and it is a chemoautotroph. It's living off of uh, CO2 and dissolved in the water and an uh, inorganic chemical compound, mostly iron, although there could be other chemosynthetic bacteria in there, but largely iron. Any question about any of that? So you actually are familiar with one chemoautotroph. The photoheterotrophs you probably are not familiar with. They get their energy needs from light. That's why they're called the phototroph. And they get their carbon source from an organic chemical compound such as glucose. Uh, the green and purple non-sulfur bacteria are two examples of a photoheterotroph. And these are different than the green and purple sulfur bacteria that we discussed here. And you don't really need to know these. We won't talk about the green and purple non-sulfur bacteria. All right, any question about any of this? You might notice that the chemoheterotrophs oftentimes get their energy and their carbon source from the same compound. Like we get both our carbon source and our energy source from glucose or some other organic chemical compound in our diet. It doesn't have to be that way, but like I said, oftentimes it is that way. And actually, that's true for. Many bacteria, like E. coli, obviously it's not true for the uh, chemosynthetic bacteria, but it's true for animals, fungi, and uh, the fermentative bacteria, a bacteria that undergoes fermentation. All right, any questions about any of that? If not, let's move on to the next slide and take a look at the classification system. Let me blow this up. So we have all organisms. We can classify them by their energy source. If they get their energy needs from a chemical, then they're a chemotroph. chemotroph. If they get their energy needs from light, they're a phototroph. If the chemotroph gets their carbon source from an organic compound, then they're a chemoheterotroph. If they get their carbon source from CO2, they are a chemoautotroph. Among the phototrophs, if they get their carbon source from CO2, then they are a photoautotroph. And if they get their carbon source from an organic chemical compound, they are a photoheterotroph. And then you can break that down further. Uh, the photoautotrophs um, can be oxygenic, photo, go, undergo oxygenic photosynthesis, 
producing oxygen or they can uh, be anoxygenic and they do not produce oxygen. We'll talk about that at the end of this lesson. Ah, uh, the photoheterotrophs don't break down. The chemoautotrophs, like I said, they're chemosynthetic bacteria. All of them. Is that right? Making sure that I'm right here. Yeah, these are all chemosynthetic bacteria. And then the chemoheterotrophs, some of them are chemosynthetic bacteria, but uh, some of them, most of them are... Uh, organisms which are other chemoheterotrophs and uh, you can break them into those that use oxygen such as the animals and then those that do not use oxygen and that would be the fermentative bacteria like streptococcus which can make uh, yogurt and uh, um uh, the um, bacteria which do not use oxygen but uh, are not fermentative, they use uh, a uh, anaerobic respiration system to get their energy needs. All right, you don't need to know anything below the red, but you should know the, the material signed in red. Any questions about any of that? So you notice with energy production that uh, molecules have energy associated with them, and that energy is in the electrons that form the chemical bonds in the molecule. So when we're getting our energy needs from glucose, the energy is from the electrons in the bonds of, uh, of glucose. And that's true for the chemosynthetic bacteria as well, um, like an H2S. The energy is in the chemical bonds, the electrons that make the chemical bonds linking H2S together. Cells can use this energy from a catabolic reaction which they will break the bond, and that will release the energy for their energy needs. And then some of that energy will be uh, converted to make ATP, which is the energy carrier of cells. And we call it the energy carrier of cells because if cells need energy, they frequently will get that energy from ATP. ATP has a high energy bond, it actually has two high energy bonds. And if you break that high energy bond, or both of them, you'll release the energy, and then the energy can be used by the cell. Any questions about any of that? All right, so when we're talking about uh, producing energy, you should realize that this all happens, energy production, by oxidation reduction reactions. And oxidation reduction reactions uh, are sometimes called redox reaction, reactions, just to shorten it. So redox means oxidation reduction reactions. Any question about that? Oxidation is the loss of electrons Reduction is the gain of electrons. So when one molecule becomes oxidized and loses its electron, so molecule A will lose an electron and become oxidized, the electron will be gained by another molecule or atom and it will be reduced, gain the electron. Oxidation reduction reactions are always coupled, meaning one molecule will be oxidized, the other will be reduced. One molecule will lose the electron, the other will gain it. And here's an actual example. We have copper plus one plus iron uh, 
three plus, meaning it has three positive charges on it. I don't know what happened to my arrow there. There should be an arrow there. Can be uh, converted into copper uh, plus two, meaning we've lost an electron, so it gains a charge. And then the iron gains an electron and it's converted to iron plus two. The copper is oxidized, the iron is reduced. Any question about any of that? Well, there's an easy way to remember oxidation reduction. And that is, if you remember the mnemonic, uh, Leo the lion goes grr. Leo lose electrons, oxidation. The lion goes grr, grr. Gain electrons reduction. So Leo the lion goes grr, tells you that losing electrons is oxidation, gaining electrons is reduction. Any question about any of that? All right. In biological systems, whenever oxidation happens, the proton, the H plus ion, is usually removed with the electron. And then the H plus ion travels with the electron. Remember that an hydrogen atom is an H plus ion and an electron. So H plus plus the electron, if they were to come together, would form the hydrogen atom. Any question about any of that? So in biological oxidations are often called dehydrogenations because besides losing the electron, let me blow this up. Besides losing the electron, we also lose the hydrogen ion. And a hydrogen ion is just a proton. assuming it's a simple case of hydrogen. There's different, what is it, isomers of hydrogen. We're talking about the simple isomer of hydrogen. So if this organic molecule like glucose loses an electron and a hydrogen, something has to gain the electron and the hydrogen. And in uh, aerobic respiration that we'll talk about shortly, it actually tends to be NAD+. Plus. And NAD plus is an electron carrier. It will carry this electron from one place in the cell to another. And at the same time as it carries the electron, it'll carry the H plus ion. So um, this molecule becomes oxidized, losing the electrons. This molecule will become reduced, gaining the electron. And NAD plus will gain the electron and the hydrogen to become NADH. Any questions about that? Anyways, this is what we frequently see in biological systems. Um, you might not see this in chemistry, but in biology, the hydrogen ion usually follows the electron. So biological redox reactions, meaning oxidation reduction reactions, are used in catabolism to extract energy from nutrient molecules. For our cells, we will catabolize glucose to generate energy. And only highly reduced compounds, meaning a compound with many hydrogen ions, will be degraded, catabolized, to a highly oxidized compound to generate the energy. And the highly reduced compound that we start with tends to be glucose, C6H12O6, a lot of hydrogens here. And this molecule will be oxidized to CO2 and water. In the process, energy will be released from glucose and some of that energy will be trapped 
to generate ATP. The highly reduced compounds contain a lot of potential energy, and glucose has a lot of potential energy. You probably don't know this, but if you were to, for example, have a cup of glucose and take a blowtorch to it, and the glucose would catch on fire, it would be so much energy that I couldn't sit here. I'd have to go several feet away, and I don't know how far away because I've never actually done that. Another example of the amount of energy you get in glucose, you can actually use glucose for a uh, one of the starting reactants that'll go off in a homemade bomb. So obviously there's a lot of energy in glucose. Any question about any of that? All right, so let's talk about aerobic respiration. This is one way that cells convert energy in the cell and then they use aerobic respiration to store that energy in ATP. And of course the ATP will be available for when the cell wants to do something that requires uh, energy. So whenever the cell is doing work, doing something, it'll need have energy needs. And most of the time it'll get that energy needs from ATP. Any question about any of that? All right, so I'm showing you the summary reaction for aerobic respiration. Glucose, shown here, gets together with oxygen gas, O2, and the uh, summary is C6H12O6 glucose plus six oxygen molecules and 38 ADP and 38 inorganic phosphates, that's what the I stands for, inorganic, combine or form six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, and 38 ATP molecules. Any question about any of that? All right, let's move on. Uh, you probably should know that glucose is C6H12O6, if you don't already know that. This is just the summary reaction. There's a large number of reactions that occur in aerobic respiration. And not only is there chemical reactions occurring in aerobic respiration, there's also physical reactions. A chemical reaction is when a chemical compound is converted into another chemical compound, such as when uh, oxygen is burned and converted into water. All right, so all cells need to generate ATP and then use the ATP for their energy needs. and the cell uses redox reactions to generate ATP. But there are three main ways that cells make ATP, and I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, ATP is generated by phosphorylation of ATP. Phosphorylation is just adding a phosphate group to another molecule. In this case, we're going to add a phosphate group, PO4 to uh, a negative three charge, will be added onto ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And there we see the reaction ADP plus energy plus uh, phosphate produces adenosine uh, triphosphate or ATP. Any questions about any of that? All right, if there's no questions, let's move on. And I need to state that ATP has high energy bonds. There's actually two 
chemical bonds in ATP, which are high energy bonds. Uh, the third phosphate connected to the second is a high energy bond. And then the second phosphate connected to the first is another high energy bond. And when the cell wants energy, it will break this bond to release the energy. And if the cell wants more energy and there isn't like an ATP available, it can break the second phosphate off as well, generating even more energy. Any questions about any of that? All right, here we go. Uh, when cells make ATP, there are three mechanisms for making ATP. So cells can make ATP in one of three different ways. First, there's substrate level phosphorylation, where the cell transfers a high energy phosphate from a phosphorylated compound directly to ADP. This does happen in fermentation and in glycolysis, where we have uh, a triple com carbon compound bound to a phosphate group, which has a high energy need, and it can get together with ADP. And then this phosphate can break from the triple carbon compound and then be added to ADP to make ATP. So this is the first way that cells can make ATP. The second way that cells can make ATP is with respiration. It has other names like oxi oxidative phosphorylation, but I use the term respiration and so does your book. Uh, respiration can be more than one type. Uh, humans can only perform aerobic respiration, and that's the one we'll talk about mostly in this lesson. But some organisms can use anaerobic respiration. And you'll notice when I'm talking about the generation of ATP, I'm not classifying which form of respiration it is. I'm talking about all forms of respiration. Respiration involves the sequential transfer of electrons from an electron uh, donor cell to the final electron acceptor. Oops, wrong one. Go there. So actually, the uh, the electrons start before NADH. The electrons come from glucose in aerobic respiration, and then the uh, NADH carries the electrons and the hydrogen to the first protein involved in aerobic respiration, which you don't need to know the name of that, FMN. And then the uh, electron is transferred from FMN to Q. And then Q transfers the electron to cytochrome B. And cytochrome B transfers the electron to cytochrome C and then to C again, which I don't know if that's a different C or if it's um, a similar C, meaning the same C, just a different location. And uh, it moves from cytochrome C to cytochrome A, and then cytochrome A to cytochrome A again, which could be a different cytochrome. And then the electron moves to the final electron acceptor, which in the case of aerobic respiration, the electron will flow to oxygen. You combine two electrons and two hydrogen ions with a half of a oxygen molecule, and then you'll generate water. The point is, is that the redox reactions are sequential. They are releasing energy along the way in small steps, controlling how much energy is released. There is not one bolus of a huge amount of energy. And that's why our cells can uh, 
generate ATP at 37 degrees, whereas if we were to catch the oxygen on fire outside, I don't know what the temperature would be, but it would be very high. Okay. Any question about any of that? All right. So the first two ways for generating ATP, photophosphorylation, the second way, respiration. And in this slide, we're talking about the third way of generating ATP, and that is with photosynthesis, or more properly called photophosphorylation, because we're engaging in photosynthesis, why it's light, and then ATP is being phosphorylated, why we call it photophosphorylation. Photophosphorylation only occurs in photosynthetic cells. So if it's green, most likely it's going to engage in photophosphorylation. In photophosphorylation, the energy initially comes from light, and that light strikes an electron in the chlorophyll, and then that electron moves about in the cell, uh, dropping its energy at different locations. And then some of that energy can be used to generate ATP. In photophosphorylation, we gener usually generate ATP and NADPH. But ATP and NAD pH are often used to make sugar. Any question about any of that? Now here you can see a slide of photosynthesis occurring, the green in the background, the grass, and these very muddy boys. That's why they're so muddy. They're engaging in photosynthesis. That's just a little bit of humor. So metabolic pathways result in energy production, and energy is released from molecules such as glucose in controlled ways, and it's stored by a series of reactions. The energy is not released in a single burst, meaning we use a, a uh, electron transport chain to release the energy from the electrons and then use that energy to make ATP. So the electrons are passed from a donor molecule, such as glucose, to one compound to another through a series of redox reactions. And this slide doesn't show you glucose where the electrons typically start from in aerobic respiration. And then they flow to NADH, and then the NADH sends the electron through uh, all of these proteins, which you don't need to know in the electron transport chain. And along the way, as the electrons are moved from one molecule to another, we can start making ATP. All right, any questions about any of that? If not, let's move on to talking about how most energy organisms get their energy needs. So with carbohydrate catabolism, most organisms use as their primary source for cellular energy, glucose or carbohydrate. This is the primary source for all of our cells uh, use of energy or making of energy. The most common energy source is, of course, glucose, but at least humans can use lipids, proteins, and other carbohydrates. To produce energy from glucose, microorganisms use two general processes. The first is respiration, and the second is fermentation. 
respiration itself can be broken down into aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration requires the use of oxygen. The electrons will flow in aerobic respiration and they will end um, they will end their flow when the electrons bind to oxygen and then hydrogen binds as well, hydrogen ion. Anyways, that's aerobic respiration. We'll talk in great deal about that in this lesson. Uh, the second way that respiration can happen is anaerobic respiration. It's fairly simpler, simple and similar to aerobic respiration with one major difference. And that is the electrons are not coming from a chemical organic compound. The electrons are coming from um, they're coming from glucose, but they're flowing to a molecule other than oxygen. And that is anaerobic respiration. What that molecule is will depend on what form of respiration the cell can engage in. So there's different cells, different species, and if they perform anaerobic respiration, many of them use a different starting molecule, and they may use a different ending molecule. And of course, the ending molecule will never be oxygen because this is anaerobic respiration. The electrons will end in an anaerobic molecule. It will not end with uh, uh, an aerobic molecule. All right, any questions about respiration? If not, let's talk about fermentation. That's the second way that cells can make ATP using carbohydrate catabolism. This slide is showing you uh, the principal steps of aerobic respiration and then the principal steps of fermentation. Fermentation is much simpler and really only involves the first couple of items um, in the fermentation process. Aerobic respiration, on the other hand, is not so simple. And it uh, starts with glucose, it's converted several times, and then in the Krebs cycle, the uh, glucose derivative is changed at each step in the Krebs cycle. And then the electrons are gathered from both uh, um, glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. And those electrons are grabbed by NADH and FADH2. We'll talk about FADH2 in just a minute. And those electrons are transferred from one part in the cell to another. And the electrons will go to the Golgi apparatus. And then the... Uh, Is that right? No, the electrons don't go to the Golgi apparatus. They go to the mitochondria, sorry. And then the uh, electrons are given off and aerobic respiration will occur in the mitochondria, specifically in the mitochondrial inner membrane. But we'll talk about that in a later lesson. Any questions about this overview? I guess I should say in respiration, there are three principal parts or stages of respiration. There's glycolysis, the first part, and then there's the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle, the second part. And then lastly, the electrons are carried to the electron transport chain. And it um, is the last part of aerobic respiration. It's in this last part, the electron transport chain that uh, that aerobic respiration is occurring in and across the inner chloroplast membrane. 
meaning glycolysis, can happen in the cytoplasm of the cell. Glycolysis does not require oxygen, and it can happen wherever the cell allows it to happen. Uh, the Krebs cycle and the preparatory step also always happen in the aerobic respiration. And uh, we'll talk more about that later. And then the electrons flow from glucose to CO2 and water. No, that's what they, they, they don't flow to CO2 and water. The electrons flow from CO2 and are captured by NADH or FDF. H D F D H. No, that's not right either. Ah. Sorry, I'm having to look this up. F A D H two, that's it. Let me go back to where I was. Uh, this slide is showing you another, uh, well, I, I should say that aerobic respiration yields a high yield of ATP. Fermentation yields a much lower yield of ATP. Uh, another slide of the over aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration in eukaryotes happens inside the mitochondria. It is true that glycolysis can happen in the cytoplasm, and it does happen in the cytoplasm, but then the uh, uh, pyruvate moves into the mitochondria. Let me blow this up. The pyruvate from glycolysis moves into the mitochondria, and the NADH carries the electrons from glycolysis, as well as the citric acid cycle, meaning the Krebs cycle, carries the electrons and the hydrogen to the electron transport chain, which is the term that I use for it. Uh, there's many terms for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. The pyruvate goes through the citric acid cycle, and that happens inside the mitochondrial membrane. We call this region the matrix of the mitochondria. And that's where the Krebs cycle and the preparatory step occur. That does yield some ATP. And then uh, the derivatives of the Krebs cycle go to oxidative phosphorylation, or I told you I don't use that term, electron transport chain. And then the cell will, will use that electron for its own energy needs. Any questions about any of that? All right. And then lastly, the last thing that happens is, is that, uh, to FDH1 now, I keep forgetting that. Um, as the electrons move from the citric acid cycle and the glycolysis, they'll move to the electron transport chain, which will produce ATP in great numbers compared to the other ways of making ATP. And uh, uh, this requires oxygen. Actually, this one requires oxygen. Is that right? Oxygen, no, it requires oxygen when the um, when the electrons flow to oxygen. That's the last time oxygen is needed. All right, any questions about the overview? Like I said, this is only where uh, aerobic respiration happens in a eukaryote. In prokaryotes, they don't have a nuclear membrane. Uh, 
So they use instead the cell membrane. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about mitochondria. All right, another, another slide of aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration always starts with glycolysis. Most forms of reverse respiration do start with glycolysis. Not all, but most. And uh, glycolysis also occurs in fermentation, which is shown right here. We have glucose and uh, glycolysis can happen. And then uh, that, instead of going to the Krebs cycle, the electrons and the remains of uh, glucose goes into the Krebs cycle for uh, aerobic respiration. For fermentation, uh, the remains of glucose will be fermented, changed from one form to another. Any question about any of that? Glycolysis is also called the emden meyerhorf pathway. And I don't use that term. I always call it glycolysis. In glycolysis, glucose will be oxidized to pyruvic acid. The pyruvic acid will be fermented or worked upon by a T cell. And I only recently just got that T cell in my game. Uh, let's see, what, what do we do here? Anyways, glycolysis can happen in the presence or the absence of oxygen. Glycolysis happens to most living cells. And it will be the oxidation of glucose to pyruvic acid, meaning we start with glucose in glycolysis and we end up with pyruvic acid. There is some ATP production and NADH production. Any questions about any of that? I think we'll get the next slide done. And this is showing you glycolysis. All of the steps involved in glycolysis, which is uh, something like nine steps this way. And then that one will be 10 steps because it'll be converted into that molecule. And then we'll go through again. I don't want to talk really about the preparatory step stage, but I will state that uh, glycolysis requires the addition of ATP right here and right there. But then we get more ATP out of uh, glycolysis. Let me scroll that down. Oops, too far. So I was afraid of. I have to be there. So uh, pyruvate, well, that's glucose, will be made into pyruvate. And there's two pyruvates for each glucose molecule. Each of these molecules will be sent down the pathway of aerobic respiration. You should note, oops, didn't mean to do that. Not doing too well here. No, oh, but it's more than one, it looks like. Shrink that. Can't shrink it that way. So glucose is a six carbon molecule. It's broken into two pyruvates, each of which have three molecules. And then we generate some ATP and uh, uh, NADH, there's the NADH right there. Here's a summary reaction of glycolysis. It uh, happens when glucose gets together with two ATP, I meaning you do need energy to get glycolysis to go and the cell gets that from ATP. But we also will make a 
ATP. So we need to add in four ADP and four inorganic phosphate. You do need NAD plus to deliver the electrons. And then that can be changed to pyruvic acid, ATP, and then NADH. NADH is the important one here. So glucose will be converted into pyruvate, and then NADH will be made. The net gain from glycolysis is you net two ATP, and yes, you put in four. No, yes, you generate four, but you put in two. And that's why we say the net gain from glycolysis is two. It does convert glucose into two pyruvates and pyruvate and pyruvic acid are slightly different. Uh, the pyruvate is missing the H plus ion. The pyruvic acid has the H plus ion on it and the acid has to be in liquid. So either wa water or um, uh, a light staining. All right, any questions about any of that? Let me check my time here. I think the lab goes to 6.30. Yeah, let's keep moving. When we're talking about respiration, you should realize that it happens on an electron transport chain and the electrons are carried to this chain and then respiration can happen. There's two types of respiration. There's aerobic respiration where the electrons end up at oxygen. So we say the final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration is oxygen. This differs from anaerobic respiration, which is similar. We have the oxidation of mo molecules released, uh, like glucose, and then we collect the electrons in the hydrogen, which are shuttled by NADH and FADH2. But there's a big difference, and that is anaerobes do not generate any oxygen. Aerobes do generate oxygen. And you can see this by looking at the cells in hydrogen peroxide. Is that it? If the cells uh, generate ATP without, well, we're going to just say with the use of oxygen, we call them an aerobe. They perform aerobic respiration. The others are anaerobes, and they do not produce oxygen, but when they go through uh, the, um, having a hard time remembering different names here. When the electrons go through the electron transport chain, uh, these electrons do not flow to oxygen, they flow to some other final electron acceptor, And what that electron acceptor is will depend on which anaerobic respiration method the cell is using. Any question about any of that? All right. So out of glycolysis, we have pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid cannot directly join the Krebs cycle, the next part of aerobic respiration. So the pyruvic acid is converted into acetyl coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is a protein in the electron transport chain. No, coenzyme A is not, sorry. A coenzyme A is just a, a molecule which combines to form acetyl coenzyme A. Acetyl coenzyme A is a two carbon molecule. 
And pyruvic acid or pyruvate is a three carbon molecule. So one carbon that was derived from glucose is burnt off and converted to CO2 in the preparatory step. Remember glucose is C6H12O6. And if glucose is converted to pyruvic acid, and then the pyruvic acid is converted into acetyl coenzyme A, we uh, start using the um, we start using the molecule made in the preparatory step. Acetyl coenzyme A can directly join the Krebs cycle. And that's why we call this the preparatory step. It is really one step, unless it's a complicated preparatory step. Most of them are one step converting the pyruvic acid into acetyl coenzyme A. Here's a question for you. How many times does the preparatory step run for each molecule of glucose? Anyone have a guess? Is it two? Yes, it's two. I was looking to make sure someone was there because everybody's so quiet. Uh, glucose is made into two pyruvics or two pyruvic acids or two pyruvates in uh, glycolysis. So the preparatory step will run twice for each molecule of glucose. And the preparatory step does generate one NADH. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Well, actually, we'll probably talk about it in the next lesson. All right, the next step of aerobic respiration is the Krebs cycle. And uh, this has different names. I call it the Krebs cycle. Your textbook calls it the Krebs cycle after Dr. Krebs who discovered it. It is also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle because it has a number of, of uh, carbon molecules or molecules that have tricarbons in them, meaning three carbons. It's also called the citric acid cycle because citric acid is the first molecule made in the Krebs cycle. Uh, I'll always use it and call it the Krebs cycle. Now here, we're looking at the preparatory step right here, converting pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A. Let me blow this up. Acetyl coenzyme A can enter the Krebs cycle and acetyl enzyme A can bind to oxaloacetic acid. This molecule here, come on mouse. My mouse has died, there it is. And then acetyl coenzyme A and oxaloacetic acid will combine to form citric acid. You don't need to know the names of the members of the Krebs cycle, but let me just quickly go through this. The citric acid cycle can make this molecule. This molecule can be converted into that molecule. And as we do, we make NADH. Come on, mouse. Sorry, my mouse keeps dying. NADH here and CO2. This molecule can be converted to this molecule, which we make NADH and CO2 again. Uh, this molecule can be made to that molecule. And this one can make ATP. And then this molecule can be converted into that molecule. We'll make FADH2 here. And then this molecule can be converted into that molecule. This molecule can be converted into oxaloacetic acid. And in the process, we make NADH again. And we end up with the molecule we started with. And that's why the Krebs cycle is called the cycle, because this cycle will continue going around and around for as long as uh, acetylcoenzyme A um, uh, is there to combine with the Krebs cycle. Okay, meaning combine with the oxaloacetic acid.
So we use acetylcoenzyme A in the Krebs cycle and we produce one ATP per cycle of the Krebs, meaning per Krebs cycle. The ATP is produced down here. We produce four NADH and that's including the one NADH in the preparatory step. So there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. We also produce one FADH2 molecule right here. And these two are important because they carry the electrons from the Krebs cycle to the electron transport chain, the next uh, part of aerobic respiration. And then we make three CO2 molecules, one here in the preparatory step, one here and one here. Now remember that glucose makes two pyruvic acids and then two pyruvic acids will be converted into two acetylcoenzyme A's. So the Krebs cycle can run twice for each molecule of glucose. So that's something you need to remember. So you need to know what's in red, but you should also know that this can run twice per molecule of glucose, in which case you double these numbers. Uh, NADH and FADH2 are important. There's a lot of them made in this step, and these will carry electrons from glycolysis and the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle to the electron transport chain. And then the cycle ends at the molecule it started with, oxaloacetic acid, and that's why we call it a cycle. Any questions about anything there? If not, let me go ahead and talk about the next one, which is just an overview. So after the Krebs cycle, the NADH and the FADH2 take the electrons flowing from glycolysis and the uh, preparatory step in the Krebs cycle to the electron transport chain. These electrons initially came from glucose. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, I'm gonna end here. This is oops, a good place to end. And then we'll talk about the electron transport chain next time. How can I put this in here? I don't know if this will work, but we'll try it here. I can make a box maybe here. All right, if there's no questions, I'm gonna log off and I'll see you in the lab at 6.30. I can't get that. Bye.